for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love. Look. 
Good morning. Welcome to Walnut Creek Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you this morning. Hope you're ready to worship. Let's all stand pleased together as we sing our opening song, His Mercy is More. Psalm 103, verse number 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And praise the Lord for that. So lift your voice as we sing, His Mercy is More.
Amen. Amen. We're going to continue our singing with Mighty to Save. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. So join us and lift our voices together as we sing Mighty to Save. Amen. Wonderful singing. Thank you. You can be seated. Good morning, church family. Great singing this morning. Um, a couple of announcements. Our adult grow classes uh, began this past Wednesday. They will uh, begin their official teaching schedule this coming Wednesday. Um, contrary to what your Friday update, if you're on the email list, what it said there, the link was not included in the Friday update. Um, I don't know who's responsible for that, but... Um, <coughs> 
<laughs> you can sign up on the app. The link is live. Please sign up if you have not already done so. Um, it's sure to be a blessing. All three classes are going to be excellent. I'm, of course, partial to one, um, but they are going to be great, so we encourage you to do that. We had a great first week of Awana uh, this past Wednesday. Um, just a reminder to parents to have your children checked in around 645, um, definitely by 7, so they can be in their place. Um, and then if you need any more information about that, any hard copies of printouts or anything like that, um, you can see myself or grab one on Wednesdays when you're checking your kids in. The Impact Youth Group will have a bonfire at the Ayers House on Sunday the 25th at 5 p.m. Um, each family is encouraged to bring a snack to share. And if you are a part of the teen uh, parents, you should have received a teen newsletter in um, an email on Friday, I believe. Um, so if you did not receive that, please let me know and I'll make sure to get you on that list. All of our C groups are operating on their own schedules now. We do have some meeting tonight. There are C group questions out in the foyer. Um, so please make sure you are in touch with your C group leaders. And if you are not already plugged into one, please see us at the Welcome Center. We would love to get you uh, plugged into that. And then finally, our Community Fall Fest is coming up. It will be here soon. Uh, we're about a month, a month out. If you have not already signed up, and I know that's the majority of you because not many have, um, if you have not signed up to volunteer, please do that on the app. I would love to have you and um, if you have any questions certainly let me know you can also donate candy downstairs um, WCTL will be here it's gonna be awesome I'm so excited um, if you can't tell so please sign up to help and be a part of that day thank you Amen. Jen, we come forward for our offering appreciate your faithfulness and giving I will say this about our grow classes um, I I am very partial I'm the pastor here but I don't know any church that offers such uh, of an offering like we have. It's Sunday school on steroids, but really much better because we have more time. We have three classes. If you have not signed up, there are two openings left for my class. I actually have two spots available, but I need to know that today. And I'll go over the requirements for that. So the other two, we have uh, some room there as well. But I would like everybody to be a part of our Wednesday night grow classes. And that's so, so exciting. And uh, God is so good. I was listening to a podcast this morning, just kind of getting ready for uh, church. And I like to have, you know, kind of focus on things and focus on the Lord, music, and whatever. And one of the guys, he was pastoring a church right out in the middle of Kansas. He says, I got 40 people in my church and we're a happy church. And he says, why teach my people when you come to church excited, love the Lord? And he says, we don't have any instruments, we don't have anything there, but you know what we have? We have the Lord and we're happy. And I believe it's not such thing as a fake happiness, but I will say this ought to be the time we celebrate. This is a celebration service because we know Christ is our Savior, and I'm so excited about that. And that's what he was saying. I think we could really mimic that and that would really be uh, something we all could uh, take a, a lesson on. Let's pray for the offering if we can and I'd like to ask uh, uh, Cliff Emus if you could come up and pray please. Let's pray. Our Father we thank you so much for your love for us. Lord we thank you for allowing us to meet together as a body of believers. Amen. And Lord, as we think of those and other lands that don't have this freedom, we ask that your blessing be upon them, that you keep them in the palm of your hand. And God, we thank you for allowing us to worship by giving. And as we do so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to do it out of a grateful heart for the things you have blessed us with. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's all stand, please, once more together uh, as we sing In Christ Alone. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 tells us this, that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So join us together as we sing In Christ Alone.
wonderful singing, wonderful singing. We're going to conclude our song service this morning by singing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Psalm 139, verse number 10 tells us this, that even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And praise the Lord for that. So join us together as we sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Amen. What a wonderful song. What a wonderful truth. Would you grab your Bibles at this time? And I'm going to ask our worship team to step down. And Josh is coming to read our scripture for this morning. If you would turn in your Bibles to John 17. John 17. And we'll be reading this morning through verses 20 through 26. John chapter 17. Starting in verse number 20, the Word of God says, I do not ask for these only, 
but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Thank you. You may be seated as Pastor brings the message. Sometimes I spent a week on two verses, uh, but we've had broken it up over the couple years. And but I am so excited about this message. I want you to get a hold of this. You have to. I mean, to. It, it's got me excited. It's had me. We look at the high priestly prayer of our Lord. And in this high priestly prayer, Jesus is speaking somewhat in the future, and he is talking about what will happen after the resurrection. Now, chronologically, it hasn't occurred yet if we're looking through the text. That will happen in chapter 18 and chapter 19 as we put this package together and wrap it up. Church and anybody who attends here and preaches is that we do expositional preaching. Now, I have to say that to some because many are new to our church, is that we go verse by verse, line by line. We don't hop around the Bible to prove some point. We try to, and I'm not saying that people do that are wrong. Some of your favorite preachers do that. But it's easy to attract a crowd when you can come up with a message that fits your preconceived notion of what you want to preach on. So that being said, this is something, if I had to pick a message, is I want something that is so encouraging, that so lifts up the Lord, that ought to have everyone in here not just visibly excited, but content with where they are. This is the best portion, maybe, of all of John, this last por- portion. He said, Pastor, I'm not that familiar with it. Why don't I see that? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Let's walk through this together, and maybe we can all encourage one another. See, in John chapter 17, Jesus has given his high priestly prayer. Two weeks ago, I preached on Jesus was praying for himself to the Father. That was verses 1 through 5. left he's given them a prayer and actually he knows that all of them but one every one of them except one the apostle john will die a martyr's death for what they stand for just process that for a moment and then we come to the last part that is guess what everybody look here that's us he is praying for freddie He's praying for Denny Atkinson. He's praying for Anne. He's praying for all of you. This, don't, do not miss this. This is his prayer for you. The future believers. And what is so amazing 
is that the line of believers has gone through the centuries, the millennium, 2,000 years of doctrine, of teaching, and it's the same way people get saved. It's the same doctrine. It's the same teaching. And he's saying, I am praying for you people out here at Walnut Creek Baptist Church on September 18th, 2022, at approximately 9.56 Eastern Standard Time from Green Minutes Time over in England. Can I make it any more specific than that? And I want to get a little more specific. He's praying for the chair, you're the person sitting in your chair. So what he's praying for, it's so good. And I have so much to say. Jesus is praying for us. Now I want you to look at verse number 20, if you can. Verse number 20, it says there, I do not ask for these only. In me through the word. The word that was being developed, the word that had not been canonized yet but will be, that the apostles would put together, that would not be officially put into what we call the Bible to 389 AD, but will be used, be transferred down, will be handed down. That word, he says, I'm praying for the future believers. Jesus is saying that. In verse number 21, he says that they all may be one. In other words, they may be unified like the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. They may be unified together. All be one. Just as you and the Father are in me and I in you, this is verse 21, that they may also be in us so that the word, so excuse me, so that the world may what? Say it. Believe. Pastuo is the Greek word. That you sent me. Then he says in verse number 23 at the last, 22, that they may believe, excuse me, that they may be one even as we are one at the end of that verse. And then verse 24 will knock your socks off. I haven't heard that in a long time. How many of you have ever heard that before? Knock your, I don't know where that comes from. It's really hard to knock your socks off if you're wearing sho socks like me that go all the way up to your ankles, right? It says here, look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also Thank you. The online audience is now complaining. All right. I didn't have my mic on. I'm having such a good time. I'm just getting so I don't care about them. I care about you, okay? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's okay to laugh. Get over yourself. You're not that good and you're not that important. I laugh at myself. By the way, when God created me, he laughed because look who I am. I'll just get this out of the way. It's the elephant in the room. Some of you want me to talk about it. Yes, my alma mater got crushed yesterday. I know some of you text me last night. Oh, do I was pastor. Good? Look, I'm not. Look, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I'm so glad my eternal destiny is not dependent on what happens at Auburn, Alabama. Praise the Lord. All right, and that's out of the way. He says in verse number 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. In other words, I'm praying. I want to see you in heaven. Are you kidding me? This is what God is saying. He says, heaven, uh, where I am to see my glory that you had given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So I'm saying all that to say, I'm going to preach a message about oneness and unity in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us. I pray for this message. You'd be glorified in all of it. Thank you for biblical exegesis. That means understanding and drawing out of the scriptures what they mean. Lord, guide and direct. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. For those here this morning or those watching that do not know you as Savior, this is a great text to understand what they are missing out on. And Lord, I pray for conviction of sin and for salvation of souls. Don't let the devil snatch another one and go to hell. Lord, bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And for the Christians here this morning, 
Let us have oneness, unity, in doctrine, in teaching, and in fellowship. Lord, guide and direct as only you can. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. It says here that the world may believe. Look what it says there. In the last part of 21, it says that they may be one. Oneness. Just as you the Father in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The oneness, the togetherness, the unity is a conviction of to the others, to the outside worlds, that they may believe that you sent me. Belief. This prayer is for unity or oneness. With the salvation of sinners in view. He was praying that believers might be one in exhibiting the character of God and of Christ. That is what would cause the world to believe that God had sent him. This unity or oneness which makes the world say, I see Christ in those Christians as the Father was seen in Christ. End quote. Baker commentary. The next verse is interesting. That the glory, excuse me, the glory you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one even as we are one. Being together and unified. And then we find in verse number 23. I love it. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one together so that the, we do not live an island unto ourselves. We are here as a testimony of what God has done and our oneness, our unity and doctrine and in fellowship goes this, that the world may know that you sent me. You cannot have it any other way. He's saying this prayer is for you. This prayer is for oneness. This prayer is for unity. This prayer is for doctrinal purity. This prayer is the church of Jesus Christ that I am leaving behind. The Greek word ekklesia, a called out body of believers, if you want to call it that, who've been separated from the world unto the Lord. I am leaving you behind, but I'm also praying that when you come, you will see me in heaven. Unity in behavior. Unity in alignment. Unity means you're intentional in what you believe and what you do. It's not some random thing of bouncing from one area to the next. There's a direction in which you head. Unity in love. Unity in purpose. Paul writes in Philippians, so if there be any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Philippians 2.2, 2, complete my joy, being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. Being together, marching the same direction. That's what he's praying for. A new commandment I give you is John 13, 34 and 35. That you love one another just as I have loved you. Also, you also are to love one another. By this, by this, all people will know you are my disciples for crying out loud, how can we as a church, how we can a church and live a biblical orientation if when people look at us, we don't even like each other. Unity. Unity in ministry in order to see you in Christ. Jesus didn't say the world would know Him by our prayer walks. He didn't say the world would know us by our eloquent mutual music or expositional preaching he didn't say that, that the world would love us by our great churches and buildings he said the world will know us by the way because how we love one another that's how they will be our disciples they know we are disciples because of that his word says we will know him by the love we have for our brothers and sisters in christ Process that for a minute. Just process that. How much criticism in the church of Jesus Christ towards other believers has been heard by the outside world that has diminished the gospel? Think about that. I'm guilty. Raise my hand, bud. I'm guilty. They're not like us. We put up a tribal system of things that has to be just like us rather than doctrinal purity 
and preferences sometimes. Another reason we must acknowledge the importance of unity of the body is we must all work together to accomplish what we are called to do. So let's look at his prayer. The big idea is unity in Christ. Doctrine, what we believe, what we teach, what we understand is required for evangelism. So first of all, the unity is for all generations. I kind of open with that. He is praying for you. He's praying for me. Look what he says. I do not ask, Jesus says, for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through the word, their word. He's praying for those. He's praying for you, your DNA, you, you we used to sing a song in junior church. I don't know if they do any. It's me. It's me. It's me. Oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's personal. He's praying. Say your name for you. You ever been called out in a meeting, huge meeting? I have when I was a little boy, I never forget. I went to the auditorium, all the schools in Jacksonville had a um, it's kind of a big elementary schools and I remember my mom going with me she was a, not a teacher she was you know a parent that came and and I don't know of course when you're little everything seems huge right I mean it looks like it must have been a couple thousand kids and I think it was like first through fifth grade can you imagine doing that today that would be that would yeah, that would just be out of control right and I remember sitting in a chair and they were having Tommy the toothbrush teach us how to brush our teeth. You remember that? Tommy the toothbrush, he'd brush here, brush here. And that was when, you know, it was a school thing. It was like a, a thing. And I was in downtown Jacksonville. And I remember going to a bus and I was sitting. And it seemed like it was huge. It probably only held maybe 1,500. But it seemed like it was like, you know, the Super Bowl. There was thousands of people there. But, and I remember sitting there. And each of the students got a little ticket. And they got a ticket when you came in and they were given away a neat invention that had just been invented back then. It wasn't the toothbrush. I'm telling you, the toothbrush has been around so old or that. <laughs> By the way, we ought to call it our teeth brush. Unless you just have a tooth. I brush my teeth. I don't brush my tooth. Just thought I'd throw that out there. By the way, when you, when you have foreigners come here and you deal with people from other cultures, we need to understand that freaks them out. They don't understand why we have a teeth brush. I mean, it's a toothbrush, not a teeth brush. But anyway, so I remember I was sitting there and I had a little number and they called my number. And I remember I was called out for this huge crowd. And I had to look at the number. I had to walk down the aisle. It was me. And I remember walking onto this platform. It was all lit up. Again, I was five I was probably first or second grade. I had no one. But it, I was scared to death. I'm almost crying, you know, coming down to going up there. And it was all. And I felt like the whole day was about me. Why do I say that? You need to look at this text. Look at me. This is all about you. Not somebody else. You. Jesus says, I am praying for those future believers, personally, you. Your DNA, specifically for you. Jesus prays that everyone who would believe, He's praying for all those who would believe down through the centuries. As the original disciples preached and taught, and God saved folks, these people would be included. As they shared the gospel and God saved others, they would also be included in this prayer. Generation after generation. The wonderful thing is, this also includes our children and grandchildren. Many of yet to be believers are also included as the Lord will one day come to take them home. Think about the unified message. Think about doctrinal purity. Think about what would happen if the message was watered down and was some... It was some schism of some that happened in the third century. The unity of the message has always remained the same. Salvation by grace and grace alone through Jesus Christ, His atonement, His virgin birth, His atoning death for us, His rising from the dead after three days, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for me and you. That message has never changed in all of the history of the church. The Gospel Church. 
2,000 years of unity on that. 2,000 years in staying on mission. 2,000 years in bringing people together. 2,000 years of caring, loving God and loving others and changing communities. We have unity in the Gospel and in oneness. And that's what He's saying, I'm praying for you. So we find here, unity is for all generations all cultures. Yes, there's cultures. And one of the things that missionaries get really messed up on, and we've seen a massive uh, kind of adjustment in that, is they believe they have to bring American-style Christianity to the field and make them change certain of their cultural things to believe. That is nonsense, unbiblical, pharisaical, and wrong. The gospel is for everyone, and you don't have to change it to be an American Christian to make that happen. And that's why we need to be careful about world missions and what is being taught and said. They don't have to learn American hymns to sing songs in their churches or Western hymns, to put it bluntly. Number two, unity brings conviction. Look what he says here. It's really good. Look what he says in verse 21, that they may all be one. Together, like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit says, unified, not not unified and necessarily agree on everything, but unified in doctrine and what we believe. Just as you and the Father, you the Father are in me and I in you, that they also be may be in us, so that the world may believe. There's the Greek word again, pastuo, that you have sent me. Believe, understand. In other words, the unity and what we believe is convicting to the sinner. Our unity and belief will, and behavior will convict. Our unity brings conviction to others. Our unity lets them know where we stand. And again, I say I'm unity and doctrine. The reality is Jesus prays for the Word of God would unite all His true followers. We have a common message that has been handed down. Unity of oneness, of understanding. He said that those who are praying for would believe through their words, the Bible. By the way, the Bible is everything as far as our church is concerned constitutionally. And when we, we, uh, we agree to uh, to partner with the BRN, one of the things we did was we went through the doctrine, the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, which agrees with what the Bible says, not what we think. We've got to have oneness in that. To believe anything else is not unity and it's not oneness. No matter what someone calls themselves, what group calls themselves, they're not Christians unless they base what they believe on the Bible. Not culture. Not the latest fad or whatever you want to call it. What does the Bible say? Jesus said, I was praying for all the Father give Him and praying for all who would believe based upon their words. Unity and doctrine. Doctrine comes from, it's it's an English word that means teaching. True and perfect unity can only happen when you're united on the foundation of God's Word. Romans 1.12.5 says this, so we, be, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually we are members of one another, but we're the same body. Unity is found when we adhere to the teachings of the Bible. We don't go off on our own. I'm not sure I was going to say this, but our our... My alma mater's football team is in disarray. You know why they're in disarray? They're not united. There's, I don't want to get in who's going to get fired today or not, but that may happen. But what I saw yesterday, and I just use sports illustrations, is they're not united in the same direction at all from the top of the administration all the way through the coach to the team. And it showed with the shellacking we got yesterday. You have to be united. You have to have the same body of doctrine and teaching to go forward. Unity is found when we examine the teachings of the Bible and we agree wholeheartedly with it. Unity with Christ is 
is not achieved by hunting some lowest common theological denominator, but by adherence to the Gospel. Adherence to, by the Gospel, the apostolic Gospel, the love, the joy, the self-sacrificing, reaching the community. The podcast I was listening to this morning as I was getting ready for church, had this guy, he's uh, got a church of 40 people in the middle of Kansas. And he was talking about how it's a happy church. He says, well, I got 40. Our town only has 400. So, you know, I got 10% of the town. Can you imagine that? If we had 10% of Erie, we'd have 30,000 people here today. Think about that for a moment. 30,000 in our church to have 10% of Erie County. Anyway, he says, but we're a happy church. He says, we don't have instruments. We, we do tapes. We do whatever we can do. We, we have nobody play music, but we're a happy church. And he is going on and, and my wife was listening to part of it. She walked in the room. She's hearing parts of this podcast. Some of you don't know what podcast is. It's just basically a, a radio program that's recorded and whatever. I try to explain what a podcast is. But anyway, so I was listening to this. And my wife said, who is this guy? Man, he's, and he was talking about they have this on Monday. And they have people reaching people. And they got community things. They're involved in the schools. Everybody knows who they are. And he says, we only got about five people that have come because of that. But the whole community knows who we are. Because we're oneness in what we believe about the Bible. And we're oneness of our desire to reach people. There's only one faith. And that's the faith that we find in the Bible. Christian unity requires us to believe what the Bible says. Do we believe that? I think we do. Removing the truth from unity tears down unity and does not build it up and destroys Christianity. Christian unity, our oneness, requires that we do not add to the Bible. Boy, has that been done. Christian unity requires us to discern what non-negotiable truths are. Discern what hills you're dying on. And is that really a doctrinal truth that you should fall through or change over? A couple of things I wrote down. Just a side note, the virgin birth is non-negotiable. You take the virgin birth out, we have no Christianity. Jesus was a sinner. I mean, you, there's so many profound effects. I think the little creation we find in Genesis is a non-negotiable truth. The deity or the godness of Jesus. There's people that will talk. We don't believe Jesus was God. He was a God. They talk about the Trinity, the deity of Jesus. Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into darkness, pass from death into life. John 5, 24. I believe Jesus Christ is the world's only way to heaven. 1 John 2.22, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and Son. Jesus Christ's death on the cross was a substitutionary atonement. 1 Corinthians 15.3, for I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. I believe unity requires that we believe the Bible is inerrant, without error. Christ, Jesus Christ's bodily resurrection, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day. And of course, he raised on the third day, according to the scripture, Justif justification by faith alone. There are basic doctrines, of the 2000 Baptist faith of mission we talk about that we we agree with the church. That is a unity. We can't have unity if we don't believe in the basic tenets of Christianity or we're willing to negotiate them away with the sake of getting along with somebody. That's ridiculous. That's not unity at all. That's heresy and leads to this church, these people not passing down the faith that we receive. Galatians 1.8 says, but we believe but even if we have an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. So there's unity. What is the basic doctrines? But the problem is, is that we got all these schisms and tribes that do believe that, even though they may not believe it. They believe all of what we believe, literally 100%, but they do things a little different, so we're not going to be with them. They're not going to be with us. We're going to yell and scream, and we're going to separate to the point where the influence is down to nothing. Unity and doctrine is important. If there's no unity and oneness. So we see. And praise the God that unity exists and oneness. This is what the Bible 
upset. I was thinking about a video we showed here, and I've got to hurry. I'm running close to running out of time, as we always do at the first service. We showed a, a church in Pakistan on Wednesday night. And we showed this church how they were persecuted. And if you're a believer, you're relegated to the lowest common denominator. And they had to clean out the sewers. And actually showed a man literally going into a sewage sewer to clean it out. That's what the Christians, that's their job. They can't get a job like we can here. And then they showed how they were put down. Hey, they were put almost like a third class serfdom like we would find in the dark ages or maybe what you'd find in parts of India with a class system and all of that. But then they showed their Sunday church service. Remember that? There's not a person here that would say, wow, they don't believe God because their church service isn't like ours. They were clapping, they were raising hands, they believed the word of God. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. They don't have to change to be like us. Unity. We're together in the Lord. The last one I want to talk about is unity focuses on the end result. This oneness he's talking about. He's praying for us. He's praying for our generation. He's praying for us. And this is what we have to look for. And the end result is being with Jesus in heaven. That is the end game. I had to find a statement. I don't know who to give it credit to, but let me see if I can find it here. I know it's somewhere in this. Somewhere in the iPad, it just disappeared. Um, well, it's it's gone. Uh, oh, here it is. One missionary visited the former Soviet Union and made the comment after living with these folks that they were extremely poor and had literally almost the scraps to save a, stay alive. As the missionary taught them about heaven, are you with me? They were over so overcome with joy and wept as they learned about the place where Jesus sits. Here in America, though, heaven is viewed as some place to go to after you've seen all there is to see, after you've done life. For many Americans, heaven would be just an intrusion into a busy schedule, an interruption of a career or goals or vacation plans, end quote. Unity focuses on the end result. What is the end result? What is the end result of your life and my life? Listen to me. What's the result? Why are we here? We're here because we're going to glorify God. We're going to be in heaven. He prayed for us. Praise God. We have doctrinal purity and doctrinal truth. Let's enjoy the ride. It's not going to be easy. There are going to be sometimes diseases are going to come across your path and negative things are going to come across your path and maybe financial disarray will come. But it doesn't mean we can't enjoy the ride while we're here. 